Good afternoon. I'm Michael Rushton from Indiana University, and uh, thank you all for coming out this afternoon. We have a very interesting uh, couple of panels left for the afternoon, two more panels, and I'm going to introduce and moderate this uh, third panel on, uh, on investments and, and, uh, and consumption in, in culture. We have uh, three speakers in this panel. We've got uh, Rachel Solovaychik from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. We have Professor Ann Markison from the University of Minnesota and Professor Roland Kushner from uh, Muhlenberg College. And we're very glad to have them here. It's a diverse panel uh, we've got on here. We'll, we'll, tr we'll try to find some unity. And I'm just going to go directly to the speakers uh, to get going so that we have more time for question and answer. So I'd like to invite Rachel up. Uh, thanks very much. So I'd like to start out by saying that I'm studying art that's a little different from the art you're thinking about. And BEA only wants to measure art um, as part of our work on trying to get the national accounts rights. And part of the national accounts is we want to get um, capital rights. Some things are very long-lived, and so they're produced in one year and yield a stream of services for decades to come. Other stuff is short-lived, and we want to account for these two things differently because we think they have different effects on the economy. And so I'm going to measure long-lived artwork, and this is actually, it should be called, enter I meant to call it entertainment, I forgot to change that slide, but I'm focusing not on stuff that uplifts the spirit, but stuff that people pay money to watch. It may be that people will pay money to watch a Shakespeare play, but most people watch um, HBO or something like that. And so um, stuff like um, a fine art is not even in the national account. It's for mass reproductions because it's just very small compared to the other commercial artwork. And so I'm focusing on five categories, theatrical movies, books, music, some television, the long-lived portion of television, and some miscellaneous artwork, whatever is long-lived. And fine art is not counted. And all these numbers hopefully will be posted in July 2013 when we do our benchmark annual revision. And researchers can go to our website and see um, any data they want to use. And so just to give you a preview, of how large uh, commercial artwork is. And these numbers have changed a little bit since I wrote the slide, but not significantly. As you can see, there's a whole lot of movies and television, and the other stuff isn't so big. And so we don't, this, the television doesn't count short-lived stuff like news or reality shows because we're focused on stuff that has a useful lifespan of more than one year, Seinfeld. It doesn't have to be, um, good as long as people are watching it. <laughs> not saying Seinfeld is not great art. <laughs> and just to, because people are not so familiar, I'm going to tell you some of the economics terms I'll use. Price index, I'll talk about how much does it cost to produce art now than it does in 1929. Movie tickets used to be a lot less. That doesn't mean that you only got one-tenth the value of the movie that you do now. And nominal investment is just current dollars when you're looking at the books on how much studios are spending, how much it costs. And real investment is then you adjust it for the fact that maybe in 1929 it was cheaper to hire actors. And capital stock is the value of all the stuff. It's last year's, the year before, keep on going back until um, you have nothing left. And so depreciation is a change in value over time. Artwork doesn't have physical depreciation the same way a car does, but it has cultural depreciation because people's tastes change over time. And also, it has just depreciation because people have already seen it, they're sick of it. And so this is... <laughs> and so this is just a preview entertainment originals relative to GDP. As you can see, there's a big spike early in the Great Depression. That's mostly because total GDP was not doing well then, and so it's relative to GDP. And then it's been increasing uh, recently. That's cable television is really making the television industry grow fast. Uh, and so this, you get the same sort of thing if you ha look at real, because the price uh, for artwork has generally match the prices 
for um, the overall economy. And if you look into the details, books have been going faster in price than the overall economy, because though that may change with Amazon Kindle really introducing technology, but uh, movies and television have benefited a lot from computers, and so, they ben and so their prices have remained steady over the last decade. And music, also the prices have remained relatively steady because of new sources of uh, supply with the internet. And so this is just to show you how total private investment changes when we have artwork as a type of investment. Uh, the huge spike in 1929 uh, to 1935, that's just the total private investment was incredibly low then, and so the denominator is very uh, small. But you see that it does make it a little less volatile. And then after you get to 1950, it's a relatively fixed share of investment. And so there's nothing too exciting happening with we're discovering new investment. We're just discovering different investment than we were counting before. And so this is just to show you what I talked about earlier, prices for entertainment. Each different type of artwork has its own prices, and the prices are based on consumer prices for books and music. We see what people are paying for what they're buying. And for other stuff, we actually see how much it costs to produce it. For example, movies, you can get a list of real inputs into a movie from imdb.com, which lists the number of actors, the number of non-actors, even their names, though I don't use uh, details on who was a good actor. But, and, you, and special effects companies, you can see that in 1935, movies, they were much cheaper to produce than they are now, but also they used a whole lot less inputs. They had less props guys than modern movies, and so we consider them lower in quality than the same movie in 2010 because they just have less elaborate setups. And so this is the second thing. In order to, we need to get capital stocks. So, so once you produce it, it gradually diminishes in value over time. And you can see that the lifespan depends a lot on what type. Theatrical movies have a very long lifespan. I believe that's because theatrical movies are shown on television, and so every time they're aired, the studio gets money. In contrast, books tend to be physical, and so once they're bought, you can just reread it without um, having to pay the author again. This is not the same as cultural interest, which we just can't measure from any data because uh, we don't have any data on what people are reading. And so somewhere in between is television and, and music. And so this is just, we put this all together to get the capital stock of entertainment. So that's a total value of everything that's copyrighted relative to GDP. As you can see, it's been rising a lot over time. Even though art has been steady, uh, investment has been steady relative to GDP, we started out at a fairly low level because the movie industry didn't really exist much before 1920. And so in 1929, they were producing a lot of movies, but they weren't yet watching many old movies. And so nowadays we have this huge stock of movies that didn't exist a um, hundred years ago and we still watch. Snow White, Gone with the Wind are still um, sold on DVD. And so this is a conclusion. I just, I'm trying to calculate the national income and product accounts when we uh, treat art as a capital investment. And so this is all just figuring out how it affects GDP. We are not trying to figure out how um, it affects culture directly, but other people may be able to use it to see how changing exposure to culture changes other outcomes. And so it doesn't affect GDP growth that much because uh, art has been relatively steady as a share of GDP. And so it's not going to be a story where we weren't counting a part of the economy that's new, that America has always been a very creative industry, and we've always been a big exporter of of our artworks as long as we've had artwork. The uh, real issue is that uh, we just want to measure what it better, that um, it's a long-lived capital asset. It accounts for a significant fraction of the um, assets in some industries that previously we knew that there was intangible capital, that theatrical movie studios are worth far more than their physical components. And now we can measure it better that they're worth so much because they have all this vast library of television and movies that can be uh, shown for decades to come. And so that's what we want to um, uh, be able to measure for people to see where the value of the industry is coming from.
Thank you. It's so great to be here, and um, I look forward to our discussions, et cetera. Um, I'm going to talk about a different kind of growth theory. Um, I'm working from macroeconomic theory, which has been very important at the local and state levels in the United States in guiding economic development. And the, the um, reigning theory is really the export-based theory. When I say macroeconomic, I mean the relationships between <clears throat> output, investment, consumption, exports and imports, that kind of work has always been uh, packaged in the separate macroeconomic sector. So the reigning theory is this idea of the export-based theory, that the only really worthwhile job to invest in or incentivize is one that's going to be sold, um, <clears throat> that's associated with selling a product outside of the region or drawing a tourist into the region. And this has been very, very difficult for arts and culture because what it means is that every time you ask <clears throat> for um, investment funds for a new arts and cultural facilities, it's really considered to be just local serving and therefore not really worthy, not really something that's going to create net new jobs. Now, I'm going to argue today that the export-based theory is incorrect. I'm going to show that it's logically flawed and has been from the very beginning because the debates have been there. <clears throat> and I'm also going to show that we don't really have very good evidence to support it, and we have some evidence actually to contradict it. And I'm going to make the case for a consumption-based theory that is compatible both with evolutionary theories of endogenous growth and with an emphasis on the intrinsic value of the arts. <clears throat> and I'm going to document this with results from a large-scale study of California nonprofit arts and cultural um, uh, organizations done in the last couple of years for the Irvine Foundation, and I, it's going to address both big cities and localities. Thank you. It's just because I'm trying to talk so fast. <laughs> Never mind. But thank you very much. Uh, first of all, the export-based theory really evolved between the 30s and the 1950s. I'm not going to say much about this, except to say that the key debate is between North and Tebow, and North, of course, made the case for how important to exports was to growth and argued in the first six decades of the 19th century, slave-grown cotton was the entire proportion force in the U.S. economy for which he won a Nobel Prize. Charles Tebow, his uh, colleague at University of Washington, wrote a brilliant critique in which he argued that, hmm, the world economy as a whole doesn't export and yet it grows. And I think that's the sort of fundamental logical flaw. <laughs> Because what is happening, there's an internal elaboration of the division of labor to go all the way back to Adam Smith that is a really about what happened. And Diane Lindstrom wrote a brilliant economic history of the Philadelphia region in the same period of time and showed that it really didn't export hardly at all. It was an internal elaboration of um, trade and relationships between agriculture and manufacturing that really accounted for its growth. Um, I've written a lot more. I've written several papers on this. But really good. Now, there are also some great national level longitudinal studies of whether or not growth or exports drive growth. And basically what these economists have found in, is that in more cases than none, and this is using nations as units over long periods of time, both small countries and big countries, that more often it's the case that output grows first and export growth follows. So again, that's, you know, on a panel day space, there are really big questions. Now, what would be the elements of a consumption-based theory of growth? What could you argue, what kinds of arguments uh, would lead you to conclude that investments in local serving capacity would be good for the local economy? And the first one is really that, and I, this is not an import substitution argument, so ask me about that later. If you expand the opportunities for people to experience culture, to participate in something that wasn't available before, you can redirect part of their discretionary income to spend locally rather you know, than buying something. I always you know, like to use in my region, small towns have created these opportunities for really coming together around regional arts and cultural centers. And instead of going to Walmart, where people are going to spend money on products that come from overseas and on really low-wage retail labor, they're going to spend money on artists and other arts producers in our region. And that, that's the example. <clears throat> So that's one, and I believe that can be sustained, and I, can, I have many case studies that show that. <clears throat> Secondly, there's a very important argument, I think, that producing for the local market first, this, this is really understanding how innovation actually works. In most places, innovators produce first for a local market, and then once it really becomes 
a good product and the process is in place and word begins to spread, then maybe you can really export it outside of the region. Joe Courtright, who's here in the audience, wrote a great piece on this about, called The Economic Importance of Being Difference, Different, in which he documented how the microbrewery industry in Portland began to really first serve a local market and then as word spread, you know, it became an export. So in other words, you serve the local market first and then you can develop the exports out of that. So <clears throat> that's the seeding innovations idea. The third is that it's possible that, and I would make this argument about arts and culture, that nurturing organizations and occupations where people respend more of their money locally um, really can increase the number of jobs in a sustainable way in your community. Um, uh, as, as opposed to other occupations where that's not the case. I, I would say that almost universally in my work on arts and culture, every time I say to an audience, an artist spend a lot more money on other artists and arts performances than they do on other things, everybody in the audience goes like this. And I think it's just kind of a known thing. So there are these important differences in the respending, none of our models ever do this. When we do economic, we never ask the question, are there differential consumption patterns on the parts of people who make the income in a sector? If we did, I think we would really see strikingly different patterns. And finally, there's the argument that Richard Florida and, and many others have made about attracting and retra retaining entrepreneurs, firms, workers outside of um, uh, the particular sector that arts and culture has a special role to play along with some other amenities as well. And that's the supply side um, example. I have written some on this. I'm not going to really speak to it. Joe Courtright's piece is up there, several other people. It's a growing conversation that's happening in economics and economic geography. Now, part of the problem is that we don't really have any longitudinal data. You've seen a couple of wonderful papers today where people have been able to put together panel sets and really show how over time, making some investments in a cultural district or in, in expanding arts and uh, uh, cultural organizations has had a growth effect. I haven't been able to do that so far, although I did do one really interesting piece of work a few years ago where I looked at the 30 largest US metro areas and I looked at the occupational structures of them and how they changed over time. And what I found was that um, uh, the occupations that were local serving, and that would include doctors and, and nurses and you know so many different things, actually grew faster by four times than the ones that were supposedly export-oriented occupations. And I just think that's a really interesting phenomenon. And that in the last 20 years, that shows the significance of changing consumption patterns in the United States, especially the rise in the share of our incomes we pay in healthcare, but a lot of other things as well. I'm using arts and culture as an exemplary case of this phenomenon, and what I'm going to do in the rest of my talk is test whether city differentials in nonprofit arts and cultural capacity and in arts participation rates and artist employment can be explained on the basis of population size, socioeconomic characteristics, of individuals and as groups, and the presence of commercial cultural industries. Now, if we really bought the idea that arts and culture is just a local serving activity, then we would expect that its presence in different places would be more or less the same percentage of activity as a whole. And, and that's kind of the way, the crude way that the methodology in these economic impact studies works. If you're overrepresented, then you're export-based industry, and if you're just the same, then you're a local serving industry. I think that's very problematic, but that's the way the techniques work. And believe me, they are very robustly used out there, almost to the exclusion of anything else. So this is my research question. Have people and organizations made differential investments in local serving arts capacity at the city and regional scales that cannot be explained by socioeconomic features of their populations and that result in more jobs per capita? Um, the methodology for the study uh, involved quite a few different databases. Um, the uh, universe of arts and cultural nonprofits in California, which came to almost 11,000, we got from the NCCS data because we started working with the cultural data project data, but it turned out to be so selective, um, so selectively not including small organizations and also ethnically um, and um, uh, traditional arts organizations that we ended up benchmarking it again the, against the NCCS. <clears throat> I have some other papers. I really recommend this study. It's on the Irvine site um, and just was published last year. 
Um, we use the American Community Survey for the characteristics of residents and economic features. We used um, data from the Foundation Center on private philanthropic giving, which in this case is just foundation philanthropic giving, not individual giving. And we used the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts. So we asked, can the urban and regional differentials in the number, size, and focus of arts organizations and in arts and cultural participation rates be explained by population, demographic, and economic uh, functions alone? These were the regions that we built for California, and I could tell more about that, but we had to aggregate up, especially for this uh, participation data because the sample size is small. Uh, but these were more or less, uh, it was a really fun project just working with different people to decide what our regions would look like. And what did we find in this regard? So first of all, this just simply shows you the distribution of arts organizations by across these regions that I just showed you and the number of arts organizations per capita. So as you might expect, the LA and Bay Area metros have the highest um, percentages of arts organizations in California, they're big regions. But when you put it on a per capita basis, they don't have the highest number of arts and cultural organizations. Um, that goes to these two interesting low density dispersed population areas of Northern California, the North Coast and North State and CR regions. So that's a very, very interesting finding. Um, and uh, on the opposite end, we have the South Coast border, San Joaquin Valley, um, and Inland Empire regions with relatively small uh, numbers of arts and cultural organizations and small numbers in, in terms of arts per capita. This is just another way of looking at the same thing again. You know, the too big populous area, but in terms of per capita, numbers of arts organizations higher in these areas and lower in others. So quite a bit of dispersion. I do want to point out that the average annual budget size of the arts and cultural organizations is much higher in the LA area, almost, you know, 50% higher than in the Bay Area, but you'll see a little bit later that doesn't affect participation rates and it, that it varies quite a bit. But again, uh, the numbers of arts organizations per capita, really big differences across these different regions. Um, our econometric work we did at the city scale. So we did all cities, three minutes. <laughs> uh, we did all cities over t uh, 20, uh, with more than 20,000 people, I'm just going to, I can't really go through all the different ones we put in here. Um, I do want to say that we had important urban economic features, and one of them was job concentrations, which the, are the number of people working in the city divided by the number of people living in the city. And at the end, I'll try to tell you why I think that's so important. Um, ordinary least scale regressions, which factors were more, most important. The demographic ones, levels of educational attainment, personal wealth of city residents. Um, the place-based ones, the job density variable turned out to be very important. We see this as meaning, being both because people are working in the community and they might patronize arts organizations at lunchtime and the businesses that employ them might also be interested in supporting the arts as a part of employee retention, et cetera. And the levels of private philanthropic funding for the arts were very important. I'm gonna just say because I don't have time that I've also done a tremendous amount of work on the distribution of artists um, by metropolitan area across the United States and they go from a high of three uh, to one, uh, you know, three times higher than the national average in LA to some very low levels in fast growing places like Houston and um, San Jose and uh, Phoenix as well as some very, you know, declining industrial cities. The one thing I did wanna show you is that um, you know, one supposition for the results we have is that the high levels of, um, of cultural industry presence in Los Angeles could really be pulling up the nonprofit sector. This turns out to be totally not true. These are artists, the distribution of artists from the PUMS data set in 2000. 54% um, of artists in LA work for the pri private sector compared to only 42% across all these areas of the Bay Area and San Francisco, Oakland, 43%. Twice as large a share of artists work in the nonprofit and public sector in the Bay Area, and um, more artists are self-employed in the Bay Area and San Francisco. And if you compute out the numbers here, you can actually see that there are higher numbers of nonprofit-supported artists in the Bay Area than they are in LA. So despite the presence of a big cultural industry in, the, uh, in Los Angeles, this is not pulling up the presence of nonprofit organizations. Very quickly, the um, participation data, first of all, California has significantly higher rates of um, participation from the NEA data than the rest of the country, and 
uh, although there was a decline from 2002 to 2008, the decline was slower in California than the rest of the country. These are the really interesting differentials across the state. We had to do this by region because of small sample size. So for the state as a whole, um, the rate is 54% participation, Bay Area 66%, Los Angeles at the average 54%. These uh, San Joaquin Valley, Inland Empire, the heavily agricultural, heavily Latino regions, very low. The rest of the state, very high, uh, 60%. So again, really, really differential um, distributions. Um, and do, these, do the higher rates in California reflect differences in the socioeconomic character of populations? No. The odds of a California adult attending at least one event. We're 25% higher than for other Americans, even after controlling for all the demographic factors. Most of the differential was accounted for by a Bay Area residents who were 81% more likely to participate than other Californians. So this is my final slide. What do we make out, this is our speculation, that over time, people in the Bay Area who care greatly about arts and culture artists, art lovers, et cetera, along with companies and local governments, built and funded nonprofit arts organizations that expanded the region's portfolio of offerings and attracted more creators, funding, and fans to the region. And also that the presence of this capacity encouraged people who weren't interested in the arts to become more interested in the arts. And um, that there was also a growing, this is a really speculative because I don't have data for this, this growing engagement placed a premium on quality arts education, which furthered the participation in and support for arts and culture. I want to say that Maria Rosario Jackson and several other people, me, and I also did a lot of work on the smallest and ethnically uh, and culturally specific arts organizations, which we found to be woefully undercounted. And we found from the CDP data that they had huge numbers of volunteers working for them. And so that if you use the metric, like you know, their expenditure levels, as a measure of their importance, you were completely off base. And Amy Kitchener and I have just written a piece for the grant makers in the Arts Reader, which will be out this next month, that really explores this small end. And I want to say I think there's a lot more going on in the Inland Empire and the San Joaquin Valley than these data really show. Thank you. Uh, some contact information for, uh, for Anne from uh, previously. And uh, my name is Roland Kushner. I'm a professor at Muhlenberg College in uh, Allentown, Pennsylvania. Pleasure to be here. I want to thank the endowment and Brookings and, and my fellow panelists from whom I've learned already so much today and, uh, and, and, and last night. Uh, uh, last weekend and this weekend are the time of the, the Bethlehem Bach Festival. Uh, you should all go. They have tickets left for this weekend. Uh, the festival is 100 years old uh, this year, and a great book has just come out uh, by the choir's archivist about the initial founding of the choir. And uh, what is especially interesting is how entrepreneurial the beginnings of the choir were. Uh, the, uh, the, the people who, who led it were entrepreneurs in banking, in steel, as you might expect in Bethlehem, in borax. The leader of the choir, his father, invented the paper bag. Seriously. Made a big industry out of it. And, and uh, uh, yeah, it had to come from somewhere. Um, and uh, the, the, the nature of their behavior was very entrepreneurial, even in this small rural uh, county in Pennsylvania, Northampton County at the time. And they were entrepreneurial in uh, not only what they did, but in, this, in the network of uh, social organizations that they set up to support uh, the choir. So this is a, a great example to me of arts and entrepreneurship, and it's not an isolated or historical uh, incident by any means. Uh, in the National Arts Index uh, that uh, uh, we've done at uh, Americans for the Arts, we've uh, been able to show that entry into the arts has been vigorous over the last decade as much as over the last century. This is uh, registered 501c3 organizations and independent artists, writers, and performers. This is from the non-employer uh, uh, data from uh, the county business patterns. And the total growth in the arts nonprofits in 
the decade of the 2000s, almost 50%, and 35% for solo artists. So we, we, we remain uh, a nation where there's a lot of vigorous entry uh, into the arts, and uh, uh, that phenomenon of entry is what, uh, what stimulated uh, my interest in this uh, issue. So some of the different uh, factors I want to talk about are what's the nature of enterprise, particularly, and entrepreneurship in the arts, what community environments foster the arts, and what are some of the strategic management issues that are faced by early stage arts organizations. And uh, uh, this is part of the, uh, the local arts index project that Americans for the Arts is, uh, is conducting, and I'm a, res a research associate with that. And I'd uh, refer you, by the way, to the site artsindexusa.org that has a pretty extensive and growing set of, uh, of data available to you. So some of the different issues in the nature of communities as they relate to the arts, uh, uh, we've heard some of these this morning. Uh, 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 the reference to, to Jane Jacobs, uh, uh, who, among other things, talked about cities as open systems that are responding to change, and entrepreneurship is one of them. Certainly the new growth theory that's part of the foundation of today's uh, gathering. Uh, we've heard uh, uh, the arguments for and uh, critiquing the creative class argument as a a means of uh, understanding how cities develop. And, and uh, our last, uh, our keynote speaker, uh, who's, who's written extensively, as you know, about the, the, uh, the nature of the city and how central it is. And uh, I'm curious to find out as we go on what works and, and what helps. Now, those are the same kinds of things that entrepreneurs in any field, in technology, in housing, in publishing, whether it's arts or not, they're facing some of the same kinds of questions. They're both macro level, social, systemic issues, and micro-level psychological uh, issues that are at work when entrepreneurs uh, engage in business. They're responding to individual opportunity, they're responding to need, and uh, uh, they're involved in a random kind of process. They hope that it's, it's successful, but they have to understand, entrepreneurs know that, well, nobody knows. And there's a, a Richard Cave's book on, the, on uh, creative uh, uh, industries uses that phrase, nobody knows. Now, at the local level, you know, here we are in a National Endowment for the Arts-sponsored uh, function, but we've also talked extensively about how the arts are local, and the arts experience is almost always local. Cultural capital, we know, we've talked about it in terms of architecture and design and food and music and so forth. They're part of, of uh, cultural identity in a community and have been measured in, in, uh, in so many different ways. Uh, uh, Maria Rosario Jackson is, uh, is mentioned here, and, and again, I'll bring up the Local Arts uh, Index, and that the arts have their, their own distinctive occupational and, uh, and industry structures. Now, I teach business. I teach management and small business management, as well as arts, entre uh, arts administration and nonprofit management and strategy. So I'm always especially interested in what accounts for the, the success of organizations um, as well. How do they begin? How do they survive? How do they thrive? And so uh, I approach this from this strategic management perspective as much as the data allowed with, with these other issues of uh, communities as environments um, uh, as part of it. So some of the, the key issues that I think uh, 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 early stage organizations and, and entrepreneurs address are, are we big enough? What, what economies of scale do we need? Uh, are we competing in the right markets? What economies of scope? Should we only be focused on earned income or what mix of earned and contributed income? Um, managerial and, 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 and uh, operational skill, are we uh, adept at what we're doing? And uh, problem facing all early stage organizations, did we have enough money to start when we started? So uh, uh, from, from Michael Porter and from just about any other text in um, in strategic management, we know that scanning and managing within the outside environment, both the, the larger uh, um, community environment, uh, but also the particular competitive arts market, is, um, is, is vital to understanding whether organizations can succeed. So with this focus on enterprise, I looked at two particular kinds uh, of uh, uh, arts entities that I thought represented entrepreneurship as well. One was the share of all arts nonprofits, and uh, as everybody else or many of you have uh, drawn from the, the NCCS data, that were founded since the millennium. 
and just took that as, a, as an arbitrary, but in the year 2012, fairly convenient dividing point between new and old. So just saying uh, that, that those founded since, uh, since the millennium are millennials, and what share of the organizations are there, and, and also what share of the revenues, and uh, by the way, this is at the county level, I'll get to that in a second, what share of the, of the revenue in each county do those millennial organizations take in? Uh, the, the other measure is what is the share or uh, what is the provision, so to speak, what is the entry into the field by solo artists? And that's, uh, uh, that's set to a, a number per 100,000, so kind of a uh, per capita. In terms of the specific arts market environmental factors, the, the, the competitive market factors, um, we took data uh, from some commercial sources. One was from Claritas that uh, uh, measured uh, e or de derived estimates of consumer expenditure on a range of eight different cultural products, books, music, attendance, and so forth. We also took uh, data from Scarborough Research, and Scarborough Research conducts about 200,000 interviews a year in 81 metropolitan areas, or direct uh, marketing areas, they call them, on about 15 different uh, arts and culture activities. So. Uh, whereas the expenditure data is how much money do you spend, the participation data, like the SPPA, is in the last year have you done X, Y, and Z. And, and uh, we aggregated those into, uh, into to one index. Another uh, data series from Scarborough uh, uh, deals with the, the tendency of people, and the, this is household level rather than, than individual, to support arts, culture, public broadcasting or uh, organizations. And those are all the things that you would think would be supportive of uh, arts and culture enterprise. The negative might be the barrier to entry that is created by uh, uh, an oligopoly power in the county. And we measured oligopoly with a, a four-firm concentration ratio. And the way you, we did that was add up the total expenses, not income. We used expenses for a technical reason. The expenses of all of the organizations in the county and then the expenses of the top four organizations in the county and derive the ratio. So um, as you'll see in a moment, it's uh, a substantial amount across the country. And then we looked at the kinds of uh, factors that would uh, affect any enterprise in the arts or anything else, household income, population density, uh, age, and bachelor's degree. And uh, uh, these were more as controls than as, uh, as things that we anticipated as, uh, as being able to, uh, to predict. About how much? Okay, thanks. So uh, the, the expectation was that we, uh, arts and culture spending would positively affect arts enterprise, uh, likewise for arts and culture participation and philanthropy, that oligopoly power would be negative, and that uh, community capacity, because it was several different things, it would be mixed. We were able to obtain data for 267 counties uh, with 183 million people uh, representing 59% of the U.S. population. Largest, of course, is Los Angeles. The smallest is Monroe County, Florida. Anybody know where that is? Let's relocate to Key West, shall we? We could all be there pretty quick. So, uh, A couple of things to point out here. Millennial share of nonprofits, mean and median, one out of every three organizations is less than 12 years old. Their share of revenue, much smaller, having trouble entering. Haven't, uh, so they've been created. We don't know if they're thriving yet. 200, in the median county, 218 artists, solo artists for every 100,000 population. I don't know if that's a lot or a little, but at least we've got a... Uh, a base point for that. There should be more, right? That's what we want. Uh, some other things to, to show. This, I think, is not uh, notable. The, this oligopoly power ratio, 56.3%. In the median county, more than half of the, uh, of the expenditures of nonprofits are in the top four organizations. So, as Anne was saying um, a few moments ago about the, the uh, ethnically specific organizations, they're uh, broadly representative of a lot of other organizations that have to fight against the, uh, the big organizations. So, the, the, those are just the, the descriptives. Ran OLS regressions, uh, and uh, uh, I didn't include the various coefficients here, but what you'll see here is uh, three tables, each testing uh, 
for the competitive environment, those are the, the variables there, a negative relationship with philanthropy, so uh, newer organizations struggle in philanthropic environments. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Didn't expect that reaction. <laughs> and as we might expect, cultural participation is good. Now, interestingly, solo artists benefit uh, from arts and culture philanthropy and certainly from cultural participation, uh, but the, the presence of large uh, oligopoly power tends to suppress solo artists uh, uh, per capita as well. Then looking at the, the more general uh, so social and demographic characteristics, uh, we're seeing that uh, uh, younger ages tend to fa favor uh, newer organizations and higher educated populations tend to favor newer organizations as well. And uh, uh, more crowded, older, and better educated uh, populations want more solo, uh, or those communities have more solo artists per, uh, per capita. We have some largish R squared, so I was happy with that. Then when I put them all together to see sort of a, on an omnibus, omnibus basis, um, again, we've got that, that the millennial share of uh, nonprofits tends to decline with more philanthropic uh, communities. No, don't get a laugh a second time for that. Uh, but uh, what I found striking is uh, how significant all of those relationships are with the presence of solo artists. So like many of us here, I've focused on, on arts nonprofits, and yet here I'm finding that, that there are some strong predictors in social and demographic characteristics as well as in the cultural environment generally that, uh, that support uh, the presence of solo artists. So I'm going to skip over these slides because they just uh, reiterate what I just said and say that you know, these are very preliminary results and in fact in the last uh, uh, week or two since, uh, since this paper was completed some new data sources came in. So this is, uh, as others have said, a work in progress. But we do have some of these community uh, environmental factors and market factors that, that have uh, uh, strong effects, in some cases more than the specific arts market ones. Uh, uh, the presence of solo artists in communities seems to be responsive uh, uh, to, uh, to some of these factors and that they seem to thrive in big cities. That's intuitively not surprising. But uh, interestingly, the presence of new arts organizations is not deterred by the fact that communities are, 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 uh, are philanthropic. Um, in fact, uh, and in fact, they're not even uh, enticed into being by community philanthropy uh, uh, either. So where we're going uh, from this is uh, we're going to try and uh, do some multi-year roll-ups so we're not just using single-year data. Most of this was just from uh, the 2009 period, continuing to improve some of these measures, um, and, and to try to do some of the causal relationships that, uh, that some of the other panelists have talked about, look, looking at early-stage conditions as a predictor of uh, organizational uh, findings and uh, looking for other measures of entrepreneurship in arts and culture as well. And uh, uh, this is, again, part of a broader project on the local, uh, the local arts index, and we're going to be integrating these data uh, uh, more and other, some other data on arts vitality research. So I want to thank uh, the NEA, Brookings, Sunil, and uh, Ellen, and uh, Bonnie, Michael uh, as well, Randy Cohen, who's uh, here in the audience, and two of my students who've been very helpful over the last uh, couple of years and, and the funders to the National Arts Index Project. So thank you very much. Yes, good, great, thanks. Well, thanks very much to our, our presenters on this panel. 
Uh, uh, very interesting work. I'm just going to ask a, a, a few questions of each of them off the top, and then we'll open it up up to the rest. And, and, and I'll, I'll start with you, Rachel. Um, yours was uh, uh, a very interesting measurement paper, but I Im immediately saw a policy question that, that came out of it. And so I, I wonder if, if you or anybody have any thoughts on this. But one of the things I noticed was you talked about uh, investments in new long-lasting art, say theatrical movies, television shows, books, and so on which seemed through the mid-40s, 50s, 60s, 70s to be fairly flat, and then around 1980 starts to take off, and, and you get a continuous trend up, it seems, in investments in all of these long-lasting uh, cultural goods. One of the big current policy debates right now is whether new technologies and the internet and file sharing and so on are killing off the incentives to invest in new long-lasting art because you're not going to get the returns on it because everybody's just going to be able to watch it for free and share it for free and so on, uh, especially in the recorded music industry. This is a, a huge debate as to whether it's killing new CD production because uh, everybody can file share. And yet your numbers seem to indicate actually something fairly healthy going on, uh, namely that uh, you know perhaps new technologies uh, maybe are actually not harming the incentives to invest in long-lasting uh, works of art, but might be uh, giving a whole lot of effects that actually increase the incentives to do that. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's a very complicated question. Just several things to keep in mind. First, BA has no policy positions, and I am not suggesting anything about copyright law. <laughs> second, <laughs> second uh, the increase in 1980 is a combination of VCRs and cables cable industry made it easier for theatrical movies to reach new audiences and television shows to reach new audiences. And so you have this trade-off between, on the one hand, it's easier to pirate stuff with new technology, but it's also easier to legitimately distribute stuff. And the net effect on investment is ambiguous. You've had sort of the same thing with music. Yes, you've had some pirating that may have hurt existing um, musicians, but also you've had garage bands starting and distributing their stuff who could never have gotten the major recording studios to pay attention to them before. And so we don't know what will happen to um, artwork going forward. And finally, one thing to keep in mind is I'm measuring the value of artwork um, for the uh, that's sold in the commercial sector. And that's a, most of the artwork that people watch is commercially produced artwork. But some new technology is allowing non-commercial artwork that people write blogs that can become very important in people's life, um, and yet they're not counted in GDP because GDP generally doesn't count amateur production. And so if you're, but if you're talking about consumer welfare, you can't ignore all the um, amateur stuff. OK, thanks, Rachel. Um, and, and just a question for you. I, I have to give a, a preface here that just to, to see um, it's such a rare thing to see Harold Innes uh, appear as a citation just warms this Canadian's heart uh, to... Uh... <laughs> you really started it and North borrowed it from him. Yes, it's okay. I'm, I'm, glad you, I'm glad that's, that's uh, recognized <laughs> and, and brought to light here. Um, uh, one of the, I wonder if you could expand on something that uh, uh, came up just towards the end of your presentation that I found very interesting, which was that uh, what you were seeing was that if you, if you took any particular region, investments in uh, by the local population in nonprofit arts organizations and, and so on, am I correct that you're saying that those investments seem to increase participation in the arts even by newcomers? So people who arrive in, in those districts that have had a lot of investment, you actually get a lot of participation by newcomers. Is that, is that something that actually comes out in your data? Is that one of your findings? Um, <clears throat> no, that's part of the theoretical premise. Okay. And I would say that uh, you know, there are two arguments there. One is that some newcomers come because of the arts. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we, I don't know how we can really demonstrate that. I have cranked the numbers from the 2000 census on how artists move, and it's extraordinary. The number of artists, um, Moving into Los Angeles between 95 and 2000 is three times the number of artists who left. These are for people who say it's their primary occupation. And in, many, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, it's actually even slightly, there's a slight net loss, but I argue, of course, that the ranks of our artists increased a lot, so we must have homegrown them. So that's another, is homegrowing. But, so I think there are two effects. One is <clears throat> you're attracting newcomers because of your arts, mm -hmm. and then there's also that newcomers come, and because it's so ubiquitous, 
people who wouldn't necessarily have done it before become interested in it. It's there. You know, there's definitely most smaller arts organizations definitely know their zip code zones. They know that they're serving an area, you know, four or five zip codes around them. So if there's really something happening in your community and it's that close, there's a better chance you'd be involved. Right. It's still a theory. It's not, still a theory. I don't have any data, evidence. Interesting. Pursue that. Um, Roland, uh, uh, a question for you is one of, your, one of your key findings is looking at new arts organizations and you find, uh, to, to me, the surprising result that a third of, of new, art, or a third of arts organizations are new in the sense of being less than 12 years old. Um, they have a smaller share of revenue, as you, as you might predict. Um, have you compared that to other industries? Like, I, I mean, one, one earlier presentation today mentioned new car dealerships. And I wondered if you looked at new car dealerships or restaurants or things like that, would you, would you find similar kinds of numbers, or do you think the arts are different? Well, I can speculate uh, uh, that there has probably been uh, entry into human service organizations. I mean, there's probably been entry into all of the nonprofit fields. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would speculate that it's been greater in the arts than in the others, but that's not based on data. That's, uh, that, that's, that's uh, educated guesswork, I, uh, okay. I, I would say. But, but uh, certainly, th the economy is growing, the population is growing, the cities are growing. You'd expect that there'd be new entry into the arts, and uh, uh, anybody who's involved with the, the social service sector will know that there are some new organizations there. So, uh, but they do seem to be uh, more prevalent in the arts, and I don't think that's just because I pay attention to, that, to the mm -hmm. arts more, but, but uh, it, it's a more inviting field um, uh, for arts entrepreneurs, and the nonprofit sector presents an opportunity for them in addition to the opportunity to enter as inter individual artists. All right. Now, your surprising negative result that high levels of philanthropy actually seem to make it more difficult for new arts organizations, is that partly explained by the fact that perhaps new, or, new organizations have to compete more on just earned revenues? I think, I think, I think that is. Yeah. And, and I think not only is it that they have to compete, I think that's probably a matter of strategy as well. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, they don't, the, art, the nonprofit arts entrepreneurs don't go into it saying, we're going to get grants, we're going to get donations, because they don't necessarily have that cultural background. And if they go into it saying, we're going to adopt the 501c3 form, but we expect to compete primarily as, as uh, on, on earned income. And maybe that's why they're smaller as well. It's because they don't have, uh, uh, they don't have both sides of the, of the revenue side uh, that, that are as vigorous in their, in their incomes. OK, thank you. Why don't we open it up for questions? Uh, I'm sure you have lots. So. Yes, we have one. Stephen, that's one right. Uh, Rachel, this is mostly a question. The, the BEA's efforts uh, sound great and you know exciting to get access to the information. I have two questions about your efforts. One, um, what level of geography is do you expect to release or compile the data for? Is this going to be national, state, metro, county? And the second question is, while I accept and agree, the BEA, ha BEA has no policy on copyright law. Nevertheless, accounting for the value of, co of the stock of copyrighted capital, um, that poses a different problem from the stock of, say, physical capital, where a rate of depreciation might be a nature of the, te nature of the technology or how it was built, whereas in, in this kind of capital, the rate of depreciation depends upon how rapidly people get sick of watching Seinfeld, but also how long the copyright is protected. And the change in law in the middle of the period where you were showing your graph might have an impact on that. And I wonder if you've played with that or worried about it at all. Uh, let me give you two answers. First, um, so far we've only done national data. Eventually we're probably going to estimate regional splits in order to have state and local GDP. We'll pro that, those splits will probably be based off stuff like employment in various industries or other proxy data because it's just extremely difficult to observe actual movie making um, by county level. And so um, we don't yet have regional split data. Second, copyright law has a surprisingly small impact on the depreciation rate. Theatrical movies, essentially none of them are, have gone off copyright just because that they were all produced um, after 1923 when copyright law has uh, be, been extended. 
But by the time a movie is old enough to be potentially off copyright, it's very highly depreciated anyway, so the copyright law is functionally irrelevant. Um, the same sort of thing with books. Books off copyright are significantly cheaper than books on copyright, and yet people are not reading very old books. Um, and so it's just not terribly relevant to the market, and it's a rounding error compared to all the other things to estimate the depreciation schedule. Thanks. We've got a number of questions. Hi, uh, Jack Walsh from NAMAC again. I guess I have a question for Anne and Roland because, uh, Anne, you, you spoke to the um, inadequacies of the California Data Project and not capturing a lot of smaller organizations, traditional organizations, even native organizations in its looking at the state. And I'm, I'm glad to hear the research that you did to really try to balance that. But um, the conversation about entrepreneurship is all, all of these being talked about in these economic terms, which of course that's why we're here today, but it's not really looking at what are the social and cultural factors that are really instigating this, especially in the smaller nonprofit world, which you know many people have cited today is where most of the activity is happening, although fewer of the dollars may be at. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we start engaging with that very rich information that tends to be underreported. I mean, Roland, when you were mentioning that, you know, in the philanthropic community that it's often um, a negative return. Well, a lot of reasons that is is because people have to prove themselves and that there's lots of data that really exist uh, in these foundations. Um, the NEA has data from when I used to do general uh, operating support to, that stop, but really shows a whole tracking and trajectory of the nonprofit sector that I think would be very valuable when you're talking about entrepreneurship now because um, it's, it's as if things are being reinvented, and what I see is more things moving in waves. And I don't think that we look at, you know, what are the indicators of the past, so when we did have economic uh, prosperity and economic decline, how that really affects the most fragile parts of, these, of this entrepreneurial world, as it's being described, which are the startups, the culturally specific organizations, the organizations that may, never, may only last for two or three years. So I don't know how that gets start to be discussed in these kinds of conversations as well. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start by, by saying that uh, the data that we have on nonprofits are, uh, through the NCCS data, are inherently those that are still alive. Um, and uh, I believe that when the IRS you know, did their clean out of, of the 501c3 uh, roster, uh, of organizations in the last year among the, the arts organization sectors that were uh, that, that dropped in in numbers the most was the uh, ethnically specific organizations. So they really are micro. They're community level and, and why that might have happened is that over the years whoever was responsible for filing the form 990 didn't. Uh, uh, small, lots of volunteers, lots of volunteers uh, uh, but not really able to survive, thrive, get you know, get past that 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 startup and growth and growth stages. Maybe more, maybe they're more like informal associations. Uh, but they got a 501c3 because they thought they could apply for a grant, even though their success rate might have been uh, uh, might have been low. Um, so uh, you know, we had we we've had some conversation earlier today about data suppression and 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 the kinds of things that make it hard to to find uh, specifics about different. Um, uh, different sector or different uh, subsectors within the arts uh, uh, nonprofit. I think that probably, uh, uh, as Anne found with the the CDP data, some of those are are underreported because their level of formal structure is so thin. Okay, um, I can add to this too. Please. So, <clears throat> first of all, the CDP. The reason the numbers are so low in the CDP is because you only take the CDP if a funder that you're applying to asks you to take it. So you know, well, you can see this thing right there. What we did, actually, I don't know that anybody else who's used this NCCS data did what we did. We did use the under $25,000 records, and we worked with the, the staff at the Urban Institute to figure out how much you know, disappearance there might have been because the records aren't as good. They're in a different file from the, from the core file, and we took out 75% of them, and we still found that 87% of all arts and cultural nonprofits in California were under 250,000, and something like 45% of them were under 
$25,000. And I'd just like to say a few things really quickly about what we found out in our you know, 40 interviews about these small arts and cultural nonprofits that were mostly ethnically specific, but not all. Some were heritage, some were in media, new media, and so on. Um, they had vi very, very high levels of, of volunteer staffing. Um, they had very unusual governance structures, um, where, which were really different than the formal nonprofit things. Some of them weren't even nonprofits, so the ones we ended up. They were very embedded in their communities. So they had responsibilities in a way and connections and help from other community and organizations. Often they were expected to play political or social roles in their communities, which was a burden on them. They were also very, they had very fuzzy boundaries with other organizations. Some of them actually were in social service organizations or who had social service subfunctions. Many of them shared space with other organizations rather than have their own. Um, they got free materials from lots of people. There were so many ways in which our kind of little box of how we think you know, really, I was thinking about Margaret's whole thing about the managerial thing, about the, you know, the nonprofit organization it should look like this, it should march and step, it should have a, you know, earnings to a contributions ratio. You know, these, these were all such creative and, you know, mission-driven organizations. It was very powerful and interesting to see, and, and fragile, and problems where founders don't let go, and just all kinds of really interesting things. But a very, very, and I really thank you for answering that question, because there's this rich ecology out there. We don't know that much about it. I'd, I'd like to actually follow up on that, on that point. Across the nonprofit sector, in the arts and, and everywhere else, the norm is small organizations. I think everybody uh, understands that within the 501c3 sector, almost all of the oxygen is taken up by hospitals and universities. Uh, 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 in terms uh, of relatively small number of organizations, huge proportion of the dollars. And when you take out the dollars and those numbers of organizations, the typical nonprofit, I did a study of, of uh, nonprofits in Lehigh and Northampton counties in Pennsylvania where I live, uh, the, the, the median size is $125,000. So you know that's only two or three people working. Uh, you know, plus whatever number of volunteers. It's not going to be a big staff contingent. It's not going to be a huge scope. And whether that's in human services or environment or, 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 or arts or any of the things, small is the norm uh, for the media and, and, and the characteristic of the median. And in fact, that's characteristic of the economy as a whole. We pay attention to big companies, but there's very few of them. Uh, uh, most businesses are small. So, uh, uh, so we should expect that that small, organiza small organizations are going to behave as small organizations do. They'll adapt. They'll find funding where they can. They'll serve other purposes. They'll serve other needs. Uh, uh, and they'll do what they need to do to survive. And I guess as, w as we'll find out when the, when the roll comes out from NCCS next time, we'll find out which ones of them didn't as well. Uh, my question, I think, is for Professor Markerson. I, I was very interested in your data showing that um, in some of the rural regions of California, there's actually more per capita involvement in the arts. And so it makes me think about, you know, kind of hypothesize that the arts, um, involvement in certain types of the arts may actually have more kind of relative impact in rural areas. If this is one of the er ways in which people interact, um, you know, qualitatively, it might, might have a bigger impact. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that or any evidence on that. <clears throat> I do. I don't have any really good hard evidence on it, but actually the first paper I wrote on this on the consumption basis for the Journal of Agricultural Economics or something like that, which Tom Gabe invited me to give this paper and, and present, I think it can be very powerful and I've seen many examples. One of them in our creative placemaking study for the NEA, we showcase Arnoville, um, Louisiana, where a single artist came in and has really transformed this town by emphasizing music visual art and length, Cajun and Creole, French-speaking people, and it's just amazing to see the effect. In my Artist Center study, I have a real, some no, number of small town studies. My favorite is New York Mills Regional Cultural Center, which again, an artist moved in. He convinced the city council that said, you want to build a regional cultural center out of one of these beautiful Victorian buildings, who would come? And he went and he found all of these farmers who had landscape paintings in their back of their barn, and people who sang in choirs and small singing groups, and he, pretty soon a year later he came back, the guy donated the building, the city council pays half of the salary of the woman who runs the center, they have an artist in residence remaining program where the artist has to serve the community as well as be in residence. I mean, in those, you can just see the stunning effect, we've documented those in a number of case studies. So I think it is very powerful, and I also think 
that it's not something that just certain places can do. Obviously, you can't. One of the Arnoville thing is so interesting because they're teeming with other towns. So one of the other towns is more the kind of spoken word and literary town, you know, and they're supporting each other's efforts rather than trying, you know, to compete with them. And I really think that there's tremendous potential in this idea of really serving your own local market and getting people more engaged, getting people to pick up a paintbrush or begin to write a story, and that that form of engagement can really help buttress you know, what happens in these very small towns. And, and, and there's another great case in Minnesota where the arts and the sports people got together to build an addition to their school because neither of them on their own could actually create the capacity for what they needed for new space you know, for game and performance. Lots of really great cases. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Hi. Um, I had a question, uh, observation from an earlier panel and a question about methodologies that are being used. Um, so in an earlier panel, I believe it was, it was a question whether or not the art is an industry. Um, but the panel ended and there wasn't time for discussion around that. And then I find it very interesting that in your presentation, you're using Porter's five-factor model, which is used for industry analysis to look at the arts in terms of the questions that you know, are presented today, which I found fascinating because I was kind of thinking about that before you started to talk about it. <laughs> and I was like, that's interesting. So I'm wondering in terms of methodology, and since it's obvious that it's coming up a lot that the actual data doesn't exist and the robustness that's needed, um, to look at the, the finite levels of the arts community and its economic impact. Of looking at other models like Porter's five factor or business analysis models as complementary to the GDP and the regression to the mean um, type of analysis that we see the economists doing to try to understand and to get to the nitty gritty of the, of, um, the phenomena that are happening that we just don't have the data as, as being spoken about to actually look at in terms of a statistical measure? Well, uh, Porter's an economist, uh, so I'm not sure that there's, that, that, that there's, a, that there's a, 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 a radical difference uh, between. He, he, uh, he tried to specify, and then researchers using his methods or his approach tried to quantify the height of barriers to entry, for example, which was one of the particular uh, things that, that I looked at. Uh, but there are uh, the, the, the bargaining power of customers, for example. That, that was a presence uh, uh, in, in the work I presented just now based on the levels of demand, the levels uh, for, for participation, for consumption, for philanthropy in, uh, in the arts. I think we have problems because we are a small sector, important to everybody in this room. Uh, and yet, in the grand scheme of, of the economy, we're at a two or three or four or five percent, depending on, on, on how you measure it. And, 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 and because it's so fractu fractionated, fractured across, across the country, when we try to look at, I mean, the arts are national. We're here with national interest, but the arts are local. And uh, uh, Anne's finding that, that uh, there's very high per capita provision of nonprofit arts services, or at least numbers of arts organizations in rural counties, is it's just because there's not that many people there, and each new organization adds substantially to the per capita counts. Uh, uh, so it, it's, uh, I, I think we're, we're going to continually struggle with uh, uh, these efforts to be more and more precise, uh, uh, and, and that's unfortunate, but, but I think it's, it's, it's likely to continue. But, but I think we should, and, and today's, all of today's papers have been very effective at bringing in diverse economic perspectives, diverse economic and social uh, uh, perspectives on, on how the arts uh, uh, develop. So uh, uh, using Porter I don't think is unique in the arts by any means. Uh, uh, I was just happy to be able to use that, that here. So. Okay, thanks. I just say one thing really. I, I think one thing that would really help you know, uh, us understand that this sector is actually larger than it is, even though I'm really for the intrinsic argument, yeah, yeah. is to, you know, um, quantify the value of this volunteer input and the, and the materials and the free space input. If we did that, and we did some attempt to do that for these organizations, we asked these organizations, if you paid the people that are your consistent volunteers, you know, how big would your budget? Oh, they said four times. They gave us actual numbers. So I think that would be the CDP could do that, for instance. I could add a data point to that. Uh, there's about 1.9 million people who count volunteering for the arts as their first, second, or third uh, choice of arts volunteering, uh, of, of volunteer activity. But that is about tenth in line 
from what they do to volunteer for other educational human service and children's activities. So, mm. so yeah. th there's a lot of people, but it's, it's not high in rank overall. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can continue this uh, discussion over the break and further questions. I'm afraid we're, we're out of time here. I'd like to, uh, if you could please join me in thanking our presenters. <laughs>